one, two, three. This is your Libertarian Crusaders episode. I have uh, some special guests with us, with me and John today. We have Michael from, would you like to tell us from where you're from? The Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and now Mises PAC. Yes. And we have Philip. I am Phil. <laughs> and I am from the Punk Rock Libertarians podcast. And um, um, I'm also the Maryland coordinator for the Mises Caucus as well. See, I didn't know that until you mentioned it today. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, so how do you guys find each other then? Uh, through, through Punk Rock Libertarians. Yep, through Punk Rock oh, really? Libertarians, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they ha- they've had me on a couple of times, and I've kind of made the rounds at this point to the podcasts. And You're like a regular now. Getting there, yeah. I try to only do it when we got something new and exciting going on, you know? But right. Yeah. Don't want to wear it out. <laughs> right. Um, and so, how long until your city's all cleaned up from uh, the rats? Mr. I, it's so. it's an it's never gonna not be like that. It's always gonna be bad. <laughs> it's, it's probably gonna get worse before it gets better. I'll just say that. Or will you abandon your city and flee? Oh, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Give Please me the, train a new coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you got any coordinators up in Montana? Because that's where I'm looking. <laughs> Would you have to travel like out to Western Maryland to find any other libertarians? Like, or are there any? There's, I mean, there's, it was shocking. I mean, this is so funny. Like with punk rock libertarians, I started listening to them and I started uh, following their page and they kept dropping like mentions like here and there. I'm like, Oh, I think I know it. Like, wait a minute. Are they in Maryland? Like, I think I know where that is. Like they're talking about. And then finally, you know, through them talking, you know, they're in Maryland and I'm like, well, they gotta be like up in Northern Maryland, almost near Delaware on somewhere in the Eastern shore. And they're like, no, they're like three minutes from my house. Wow. And, and of course we call it small because everyone around Baltimore knows somebody through somebody. And of course, I, Matt, uh, I was just commenting on the page, and Matt uh, sent me a friend request, and I he had like six mutual friends I didn't even know that were his friends, and so through that we made the connection, and uh, he asked me to come on one time, and I've been on pretty much ever since. <laughs> nice, good, <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, I like your other host, uh, Kylie Wagner. Yeah, Ky- uh, Kyle <laughs> Wagner. Kylie wasn't there. Ky- Kylie's still <laughs> deep in some closet somewhere or something. I don't know. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I don't know the proper verbiage. <laughs> right. Uh, so we're here today at the Ron Paul Peace and Prosperity Conference. This is a, their third year doing it, mm-hmm. right? And I believe it's the fourth. I, I think it was fourth, the fourth. Fourth, fourth. I think. Uh, fourth? I'm, I'm not okay. sure. I'm not. Yeah, this is my sure first time. You've been here before. Yeah, I've been uh, but two other times. So this is like the third time. And right. I missed one one year, so I'll never get that year back. <laughs> yeah, it's rough. <laughs> I really like that uh, the Colonel, the uh, maybe McGregor. Feel, yes. Yeah, I feel like I'm like. Uh, Back in boot camp or something, and the way he <laughs> talks. <laughs> yeah, I've heard him. I've heard him on the podcast before, uh, probably on the Liberty Report. And uh, so he comes out. and He's like, "I'm going to vote for Trump." And you're like, "Oh, okay. All right, <laughs> right let's, yeah, let's get that out of the way first. All right, right. cool." <laughs> Davis Stockman is like, "Trump, Trump, 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 Trump." Right. And then, <laughs> and then he bring him in the end. He's like, "Trump." <laughs> it was an interesting mix of, of characters because, like, you got Ro- uh, Lou Rockwell, who's basically. Uh, espousing the anarcho-capitalist position, right? And then you get somebody else who's like, no, I'm voting for Trump. So. Right. <laughs> I think uh, there's, there's an acknowledgement then, maybe perhaps that uh, somewhere along the way, things have split in a big divergence from the left and the right. And it's better to have allies because the left will ally with anyone who loves uh, communism or wants your stuff. And so, you know, you'll... They're with the like out left with like Maoists and things like that, and so like we're with us. We're like, why pigeon ourselves also into a smaller group when we have good people who also want to at least limit or shrink the size? I mean, he's very anti-war. Everything he said seems right. very yeah. uh, sound. Right. Yeah. I don't know if his list will get to Trump, but um, <laughs> at least with Republicans, I know they've always been very pro-gun. For the most part, right? Aside from some of the recent stuff, right? Yeah. At least I don't have to shy away and talk about capitalism with republicans uh don't have to like pony it up and say like uh oh, it's it's free market or trying to sugarcoat the word i'm trying to use right but you went into now with the donald trump uh protectionism and you know economic nationalism that type of stuff that's what you're gonna run into and right a lot of people these days are now defending tariffs and i've never heard before in like the, the 30 years i've been alive i've never heard re- up until the past like few years of talk about tariffs as much as i have from people that would never say it before right i think that might be like um one of those weird economic lessons they just haven't come across right <laughs> like there's like they're, they're free market for a lot of areas or pro and then some areas like they just never really considered it like uh they've never considered like the david friedman arguments they they're still stuck on his father's arguments 
Um, and I think what's the uh, what's the the strategy for that? They think if they can uh, up the tariffs against China, China will eventually drop them too. Yeah. But right now they're recently just trying to increase that, right? Yeah, it's like competitive. You know, right. we have to defend ourselves from their tariffs by taxing more. <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> yeah, it's a wild game of chicken. I heard that uh, tariffs are a tax that Americans pay. <laughs> <laughs> is this true or? I don't know. Libertine uh, social media has been talking about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. That's why I've been hearing about. I guess a <laughs> strong defense is a good offense then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So what do you guys think of the conference? This is your first time, both of you, right? Yeah. We yeah. just popped our cherries, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> red all over yeah oh. <laughs> yeah no it's been great i i have a, a a woeful situation i bump into when i go to these conferences where i end up having to go back re, back and rewatch the speeches because i'm like networking or talking yeah. or trying to put things together so i end up having to go back and rewatch the speeches this is like the same and you Oh, I'm saying, yeah, I was just going to echo off that, but like we're blessed in this day and age, you know, now where that's good, probably going to be up on the Liberty Report probably all next week, everyone's speech, you know, one by one. So you definitely get your chance to like real quick too. But yeah, I saw, I saw a lot of people networking and moving around and stuff and I'm like, wow. Yeah. But that's, that's awesome though. I had a great, I mean, this was, this was awesome. Like, I'm really happy I came. It's great to see uh, Ron Paul in person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is yeah. that your first time? Um, no, I met him at uh, the Mises Summit in Asheville, I think two, three years ago. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and he gave a talk there too. And, and But this was more, I guess, was a longer talk, I think, perhaps. Um, but it's good to see him still active, still moving, right? Yeah. Oh, he's like 84 years old. He just turned schools. 84, but he yeah. still got the, the gleam in his eyes. You know right, what I mean? And right. One observation that I thought was really cool is, you know, Lou Rockwell's here. Daniel McAdams is here. Uh, Hornberg is here. All these people that he's been friends with for decades. And yet he's sitting at a table with a bunch of kids. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I thought that was awesome. Yeah, that was really cool. He's back there in that corner with uh, you guys. You took an awesome <laughs> picture. Oh, I loved it. That was so funny. I thought that was the best thing for um, describe what happened. So basically, I was sitting behind him, and there was somebody sitting in front of us, a uh, friend, Natalie. Uh, she does a lot of the memes for the Institute and stuff like that. And so she let me know that she was taking a picture. So, like, kind of right behind Ron's shoulder, I'm sitting there like this. <laughs> hey. <laughs> you know, like, so I just made it was it like a cool fun. Joshua Smith thumbs up style, yeah. uh, right behind his head. It's just so funny. It's classic. Um, but I, I, Hornberger was here. I didn't see him. I, I saw that you made that post. I was like, what? Yeah. Where? <laughs> like, I, I did, thought I you would have spoken. Yeah. That's yeah. I don't know, but I had a pretty good talk with him because I'm trying to convince him to go ahead and run. So I was yeah, trying man. to bet, um, give him fifty dollars for him to raise his hand and say, "Excuse me, uh, personal point of privilege." Personal <laughs> point of privilege. John Kennedy here. He him. Uh, <laughs> Richmond DSA. <laughs> <laughs> how oh, they, that would, how did they get through any of this? There's, you guys are talking really loud. It's really starting to trigger me. <laughs> <laughs> guys, I came here to study. <laughs> just uh, just just here. Yeah, right. I was telling you, that's what, that's what we do. <laughs> guys, no, no standing up. Some people are you know, it's, uh, not able to stand up. Uh, look at Lou. Rude. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Lou's doing okay. That's the first time I've ever seen him. I've, uh, yeah, he didn't, I mean, he looked pretty rough out there. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it was. he talked and uh, he read his speech and he was – it was good. It was a good speech. I uh, just, you know, he's definitely not Ron Paul. Like right, Ron Paul right. could, you know, he had the whole crowd just because this is my first time ever seeing Ron Paul in person. So right. just hmm. everything has always been YouTube videos or even going back for like to MySpace when I <laughs> back in the day. So this was pretty cool. Like seeing him and you could just tell like, he, he was getting everyone laughing. He was engaging and yeah. Lou was kind of sitting there reading his thing. But the speech was awesome. And I was like, I was listening to him like, oh, yeah, right on. But it's just, you know, he was just kind of stumbling over some of his words i have no room to judge because i've been doing that this entire time so but um yeah it was cool though it was it was real it was real fun and yeah. he's always been like that like ron paul i remember i was working at the american conservative union in uh, college for an internship and uh loser. yeah <laughs> and uh but that they run cpac and so he appeared at cpac and it was like in 2008 or something and or 2007 and, and all the students were up at the front rushing and it was a lot of energy and uh so when i compare this to that i'm like oh well this isn't that crazy but you know but it's funny to hear somebody else who's seen it for the first time and uh it, you know seeing okay that is exciting like so. yeah like just like what mike said he's got like that in his eyes like you still see it and it's just the passion's still there and like i could still he was still engaging just like i i he, you know sometimes if you listen to like the liberty report i don't know if you guys check out like, i check it out like every day it's in you yeah. know it's 
it's real short it's easy to listen to but you know sometimes he's his throat he's got something in his throat and he doesn't mm-hmm. want to clear his throat and he sounds like he sounds older than what he actually is when you see him on stage and talking he's engaging he's got his hands moving it was just really cool like the uh, music's still playing in his heart yes yeah. 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 he still has presence yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. for sure um that was a tearjerker yeah <laughs> i think um when i first heard of him i'll be honest i wasn't a fan but i wasn't really much of a fan of much politicians and I think, uh, I mean, I was doing the, the Most Libertarian Award back then. And I was like, oh, he's a politician. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, look, he's done his, uh, his time. And uh, how much has that changed, right? Um, and then start hearing the other arguments about how many people he's reached, though, through that. And that maybe, like, hearing him talk about, like, it wasn't really his intention. And that just kind of happened. Uh, but it was a great opportunity for him to still be uh, what you were calling, like, his nickname, what, Mr. No or... Dr. Dr. No, Dr. No, Dr. No, yeah. Dr. no right? Um, and then I had a chance to talk with him at the Mises uh, Summit in Nashville and ask him, because after um, uh, the talks downstairs, everybody went upstairs and there was like Ron Paul just hanging out, you know, eat, getting some food. I was like, does anyone know that he's standing right there? <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, I'll just go up there and talk to him. And uh, so I asked him some questions like, what do you think about um, privatizing everything? And he was like, you know, as long as you abolish the Fed, you know, then I can see that. It's like, yeah, I didn't even like private security. Yeah, private security, everything. But the Fed is going to be abolished for sure. Like, yeah, of course. <laughs> Fair trade, yeah. Dude, fun thing real quick before we're talking, man. Yeah. If you're listening to this right now, in the next room over from us, we you were able to snag this awesome room right next to where the after party oh, yeah, gold members. Hanging out. Yeah. Yes. Dude, he's like right across to Dan McAdams and we everyone could else. storm it, narrative style. <laughs> they can't stop all four of us. Just tell them, like, this is your personal property. So. Right. <laughs> Wait, I'm not, trying to cultivate a relationship, so I might sit that one in. <laughs> like, Who let these guys in? And then he tackles you. Yeah. He's like, see, I'm here. I'm a good guy. I'm here to tackle these these crashers. I brought up the uh, IP thing because that was the thing that bothered me back then. But I guess um, I find that there's there's still a lot of people that I like, and they may have some, like, I'm not at, like 100% in agreement, but I don't think – I think as long as we agree, like 90% of the stuff for libertarianism, I'm great with that. I used to be like, well, it's got to be 100% hardcore. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, no, but now more as I've grown and matured and seeing uh, the bigger picture and seeing that these people do want freedom, there's, there's a different way that they want to approach it or a different strategy towards it, but their end game is still freedom. And they may not have come across all the arguments I have as well. So I asked him about the IP stuff. He said that's, uh, that's something he still has uh, still looking into. Um, that was the whole rompaw.com thing. Um, oh yeah, that that controversy. Right. Yeah, um, and so I said, yeah, you know, there's arguments about that I haven't really uh, looked into, but it's something that I definitely is on my plate to come across. And so we talked about that, um, but, which was a good answer, political answer. Uh, and the third one was asking him, uh, what was it? Uh, no, it was, it was another guy who came up and saw that I was talking to Ron Paul. It's like, so I want to run into run into uh, run for politics. So what do you think, Ron Paul? I'm like I want to like I'm, I'm graduating, I'm getting out of college, and I want to also go into Congress. And Ron Paul's like, what, what do you, should I do it? And he's like, don't waste your time, uh, get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> and when he said that, I was like, all right, I'm just, I'm, I'm now pro Ron Paul. <laughs> and he said that in a speech today too. Right? Right, yeah, right. He did. He talked about that in a speech. That's so funny. So that, that changed my mind ever since after that. And after that, looking really more about it, I was like, all right, I like this guy a lot more now. Um, he's done a, he's put his time in. I mean, these arguments that we have now about like politics not working and stuff like that weren't really around back then. Uh, that was like, I could see him testing the waters and going into it and going to the belly of the beast. But like him saying, like, it didn't really bother him even like the evilness of the situation. He had low standards for them all. Um, so it didn't really corrupt him, but... Low standards, and the other one he always he always mentions. Well, usually is being realistic, right? Grounding yourself, right. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm all about Ron Paul now. A uh, big turnaround, and I think uh, what he's done is uh, is amazing. Especially learning more about him, and then led me to the Mises Institute, and him being a big part of his foundation. Uh, so I had no idea all this stuff was kind of connected. Yeah, he was like the right guy at the right time, and he knew his stuff. And it's funny to hear him say he's like still researching IP because I'm sure he knows more about that issue than like I'll ever know. <laughs> right, right. But at the very least, he was on the stage ready to go with the knowledge, and he was ready to shoot back at like Rudy Giuliani. You know, and I, th- right. I see that as like one of those moments where a lot of people took note and uh, 
you know, changed or at least started to investigate. So I have, I have a question for all three of you because I feel like I'm, I, I had a unique experience with the whole Ron Paul experience. Was Ron Paul simply a, a, a intellectual awakening for you guys or was there something more? Because there was way something more for me. Uh, what was it for you? Well, I, I, I could talk about this publicly now. I finally put it out on Facebook. But like I was 18 at the time and I, I had a pretty extended period of time in my life where there was a lot. I'm not going to get into detail, but there was a lot going on at home. And I wasn't a very happy person. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wasn't a, or really a very mentally healthy person um, at that point. And so Ron, while yes, he was an intellectual awakening for me, he was also like a role model for me when I needed one very badly. Like he, he gave me a vision of the kind of person I want to be like, mm -hmm. you know? And it really helped me to change my life around. How'd you come, how'd you come across him? Uh, a, a YouTube video with uh, it was a YouTube of of, of collections of, of his uh, debate responses in 2008 played to uh, uh, Don McLean's American Pie. Hmm. Um, there was a lot of that. Like people yeah. just made it on their own. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're starting to see YouTube. I, I swear, YouTube is starting to slowly get rid of all that old stuff, and now it's all like, po like content. You know what I mean? And not just like homemade, like stuff that people make on their own. You know? But um, but yeah, no. He he gave me like a vision of the kind of person I want to be like, and it really helped me change my life, and it really ha helped me to uh, break the funk in my mind that my life doesn't have to be this like depressive, horrible thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and uh, so. I, I got to believe that there's other people that he affected in that way as well as the intellectual way too. Right. That is a good stalwart of a good model of how to be. Um, yeah. I mean, like there was definitely a movement and like I'd be driving my car with a Ron Paul sign in the window and somebody would beep and like say, what's I up? I still get it. You kind of feel that yeah, sort yeah. of like, <laughs> all right, we're all in this together, you know? And, and so, yeah, for sure. I, I definitely got that. Yeah. Sense. I will, I will, I will always have a Ron Paul revolution bumper sticker. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, for me, it was it, it was like a connection. Like going back to what I said before, MySpace. Like it was. I, I mean, I was new. I was just twenty one, and I was like straight edge at the time. I didn't do drugs, and I didn't drink or anything like that. Man, but I was Ron always Paul put you on drugs. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, people always because like I just I felt like Ron Paul was the like he didn't help me like in your sense like help you kind of show you the you know the person you, you know you should be or almost like for me it was like he was showing me the person like how i was like yeah like it was all like i always tell everyone like everyone has that libertarian moment or that that one time it, when it usually it's ron paul at the debate you know versus giuliani and but for me it was just a lot of dots and i feel like we're not me like it, going back and hearing this and this and this and stuff i can still like i still hear about and think about today i'm like yeah that's right i was good in that issue and and just with that all the dots connected with ron paul like i felt like that's where all the dots start connected and i'm like yes like this makes sense like even though i didn't drink or smoke time i'm like but i don't care if people smoke weed like i know people smoke weed and it's not a bad thing but for me i felt like it was a bad thing and i couldn't handle it so i didn't do it because it was my personal choice mm -hmm. and a lot of people in the movement back then were like bring back prohibition and that that's like that was their thing and i was like no no i was a ron paul supporter and a lot of people were like really you straight edge and you don't support, you know and you support ron paul i'm like yeah because like i feel like it's everyone's choice to just make that decision and I, it was it was it just kind of showed me who i really was and kind of just like put a, a name to what what i these feelings i had inside and, and just being like well you know i grew up in like a conservative not a really a conservative just a republican household and but I was also, I went to Catholic school and I was taught, you know, anti, we were from as early as I can remember, you were anti, they were anti-war, anti-communist, anti, you know, pro-life. And that kind of, when the war started, I was like, I don't like this. Like, it's, it's gross. You know, I mean, like, really? It's like a waste of money and people are dying. It's just, I don't know, but I wasn't really overt with it, but it was always a feeling I had down there. And now, like, when I hear Ron Paul just was like, Fuck you, Giuliani! Like right there, I was just like, <laughs> yes, like cool. There's someone else who who you know happens to have the same opinion to me, and I really wasn't in a lot of the political circles, but I still had this Ron Paul 2008 uh, little sign up on my MySpace wall. Oh, nice, nice. <laughs> right above my top top five front was it top five, top seven? What was it? I know. Do you guys remember on MySpace? Uh, top six. <laughs> top six. Okay, uh, top six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the other the other thing that was so great about it that really had an impact on my life is I kind of found my home. You know what I mean? Right, like, because prior right. to that, you know, I was I was pretty young and I, I had all my nerd friends playing a lot of video games, BXR and Fools on Halo 2, you know, like, and and once I started getting into all this, you know, I was having 
diverg social divergences with my friends. But then once I found this like underground world, right, you know what I yeah. mean? Then it was like no looking back ever. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like just took off and I I've never been the same since. You found the group. Yeah. And how can we be wrong? How can libertarians be wrong in like history <laughs> looking back? Uh, yeah, I think it's wrong to aggress people. I don't know. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, le and leftists are obs obsessed with that term, you know, being on the right side of history. But I feel like if you're a libertarian, you are the ones who are on the right side of history. Right. It's like they're so desperate to be one of the, the, the protesters back during the Civil Rights March. They want to be in those old black and white photos. And I feel like Ron, hopefully, one day it's going to be like that with like Ron Paul videos, like showing people like, hey, I took a stand. Like, I... I was for this and I remember there's a sign like on my in my town like it's like a relatively small town but this hill like it's where two, the road kind of splits off and goes into a fork and on this hill like right in between there was it just fell down it was a sign that someone hand painted and said Ron Paul 2012 and it was there and hmm. it was there since 2011 hmm. and it finally fell down like I think like 2017 uh, but it was there like all those years every day I'd pass it coming home from work and I'd see it and like yeah, <laughs> that, that reminds me of like what was probably the craziest thing that I did back then was um, me and my buddy Kyle. Uh, we had found a pool tarp in somebody's trash, right? Yeah. And so we pulled it out and we went and got paint and <laughs> we we painted a huge Ron Paul 2012 on this thing. And then in the middle of the night, uh, we went out to this. It's called Trestle Bridge in Downingtown and uh, downtown Pennsylvania. In the middle of the night, we went there and there's like a down fence. So there's a big bridge and, and there's a uh, out of service railroad track up there. But it's a really cool view of the town and everything. So we went up there with like zip ties and, <laughs> and, and chains and everything and chained this thing to the fence that was there that down <laughs> and threw it over the side. So there was this huge pull tarp That's so cool. with Ron Paul 2012 <laughs> hanging off of the, the bridge going into Westchester, which is like the local college town. Uh -huh. And then we went back the next day to look at our work and the wind just went... <laughs> <laughs> and then I was like, dude, I think we have to get like heavy chains and like thread it through the bottom. And he was like, and he was like, oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> you know, like That was the type of stuff that people were willing to do, though, because they really believed in this candidate. Yeah. And I don't see that with... I mean, they tried to do something with like you Beto O'Rourke. Wait, wait, you, you didn't do shit. So like, you didn't do shit like that with Gary Johnson. Yeah, right. <laughs> People aren't willing to sacrifice their time. For I think Ron Gary Paul Johnson. should have done the, the whole dental thing. I'm getting a you know tooth filling in here and. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, right. be like the people. He didn't change people. enough tires. Oh, right, there we go. On YouTube. <laughs> oh my God. I yeah. was into um, and well, I came from the objectivist side of things, uh, Randy and stuff, and uh, I came across like the anti-war website. Uh, which led me to the Lou Rockwell website. And then um, I didn't connect all the pictures. Like, a lot of these people knew each other. And, of course... Yep, same here, yeah. Right, right. And then, uh, like, in the middle of all that would be, uh, like, connecting to the Mises Institute website. Uh, and in the middle of all that would be Ron Paul. And I was like... You're right, right, yes, right, right. Yeah. It's like, whoa, Jesus Christ. Every, <laughs> it's like I'm seeing, like, the bigger picture now, all these puzzle pieces kind of going together. Um, and when I went to the Mises University back in 2016 and like was able to go into the history and, and see further back, because uh, I didn't know anything uh, outside of like objectivism mm -hmm. uh, or any other kind of history and stuff like that. Um, apparently, Rothbard hung out with uh, Anne Rand a few times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess they had a falling out or something. Yeah. yeah falling out. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. When you look at the couple of guys, though, like Lou, Ron Paul, um, it, you see, you're like, we're kind of looking at what the libertarian movement was yeah. for a long time. Right. Yeah. You know, and I, I like to remind people of that because people like to paint this picture that everything is so hopeless and, and everything is so bad and, and, and all that. And it's like, dude, these guys didn't have the internet. There was probably like 15 hardcore libertarians in the whole country at one point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I, I mean, I know the Libertarian Party is a lot smaller, but like that was literally founded in this dude's living room. You know what I mean? Like right. in, in yeah. David Noel's living room. And, and we forget our past in a way and 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 we would i think if we didn't do that we would be a lot more grateful and and a lot more i think optimistic because there's a lot of reason for optimism there's so there's so many more people now there's a good measure of success for sure the mises institute used to be uh an office room in auburn alabama <laughs> right in the very beginning for the first couple of years and now it's a nice beautiful uh, estate yeah um, i feel like i'm going to like the xavier institute uh, going <laughs> uh 
and I guess Ron Paul would be Professor X, but he kind of looks yeah. more like a Magneto. <laughs> for, gifted, for gifted children. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, have you guys done the whole – yeah, I think you guys – I went, did Macy's right? U this year. Yeah. Right. Have you done never that Never been, yet? never been. Uh, I think there's a, one of my favorite photos I saw there was the whole, like, union when uh, – Jeffrey Tucker used to be friends with all of them. And there's like a very young Tom Woods in there too in the <laughs> middle. And you have Rothbard over here. You have Hoppo over here to your left. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's like classic <laughs> X-Men kind of image. <laughs> <laughs> um, what did what did you uh, find over there? I guess it was kind of worthwhile, Mises, you. Well, I am the chair of Mises Pack. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did that come before? That came like before you went to Mrs. U, right? Oh, yeah. 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 But um, so I, I should probably do everything I can because what was funny about that is I'm one of the only non students and I've never, like, I did one semester of Liberty University online and mm -hmm. then I got the job I was hoping to get into and stopped. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so, <laughs> they so. Do accept non traditional students, yeah. Yeah. And I was invited there as a guest. Oh, great. You know, and, and uh, so I, I, I feel. I'm a layman. I'm not going to be the. I'm not going to be at the level of the scholar that that these people are. But at the same time, I'm going to have to dedicate my life to. If I'm going to use the name and everything, I should probably. Right. <laughs> what led you to do the um, Mises Caucus? I'm sorry. What led you to initiate to, to to start? So found. So two th the two main things. Um, one, just comparing the experience of the Ron Paul Revolution to the Gary Johnson campaign, um, it was night and day. <laughs> where like whereas whereas Ron the Ron Paul revolution I would I would say it was one of the funnest times of my life literally it was it was one of the best times of my life um and the Gary Johnson campaign was not um <laughs> I you mean, didn't that, fall off your share. So much to <laughs> in your voice. Yeah, I yeah, said that yeah. kind of, it was not. <laughs> the, well, the, whole, the whole climate was nasty, man. Like the, it, it was, was just, it was horrible. Like it, it was. You know, we weren't even. There was no coalition. Uh, uh, coalescence around Gary you know what I mean and he didn't inspire people and, and so we were left to defend ourselves against Bernie people and defend ourselves against Trump people and then Molyneux kind of took a different path and then Alex Jones took a different path and and then, then the years prior to that and and, right. and it was just nasty and it was very impossible basically to get actually motivated you're just kind of going through the motions you know um, so that and just what the desire to want to recreate the the ron paul revolution because my observation is is um if we could ever recreate that that energy that positive feedback loop that he started that we all felt and fed off of when he was making fools of people on on these debate stages and giving us moral victories that way um if we could ever recreate that within under the guise of an organization as opposed to a singular campaign it never has to end you know what I mean? The party never has to stop. Right. And whereas with a campaign, it gets the national convention, they cheat them, and that's, that's it, that's all, right. you know? And uh, there usually seems to be like uh, the thing with like a lot of libertarians were like, they only care only when election season's coming up. And then for like those few months and after it's over, it's like, well, that's it. It's everything's quiet for like another four more years. Yeah. 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 I, we ran into this LaRouche person. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche. Yeah. 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 And um, it, at the at the conference today, and I was just like. Wait, he was here? No, it was this person who was handing oh, out. Oh, like, oh, oh. I was, LaRouche. I was like, <laughs> no, yeah. he might actually be dead. But, but yeah, like, like, the, she was handing out like LaRouche literature or something. Oh, yeah. name Is that me. what that and was? I was just, yeah. Oh. It was about going to the moon or something. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah. I saw that. That's okay, that's a linen and, oh, and, and I was just well, like, I was thinking, I was comparing that in my mind to the Ron Paul experience, and I was thinking, you know, this this isn't about Ron Paul per se. He's not some cult right. of personality. It's We're about yeah, and and that's yeah. the funny thing when I think about those people because they kind of think they kind of like deified Linda Larouche. Somehow, oh yeah, right. Dude, his <laughs> story is so funny. Like, it's <laughs> just like he was a communist, but. And it was starting out, and then they were like, he wasn't communist enough for them, so he got like all butt hurt and started his own thing. I was like, well, I'm going to go this way, and then oh, dude, it's weird. There's people like protest outside of like my when I work like several times. It's who's this person? Lennon Larouche, like his, he's this crackpot guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's got some things that are uh, like, like okay, kind of like, but everything else is just kind of weird. But yeah, it's it's like a cult. It's almost, it reminds me of, like a cult. Yeah. And this guy wants a woman on the moon. Is that what she was? This, yeah. So I guess whatever organization <laughs> she's with is named after Larouche, and she's handing out literature uh, that says like, we need to put a man on the moon and then Mars, and it's only going to be thirty billion dollars. And I thought she said woman, man, and a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We got I don't know why. Bars. <laughs> right, yeah. right. 
and that'll improve so everyone's great. lives. And she said they won't come back good. either. They, they won't, won't come back. back. No, you won't. <laughs> You're already gone. Yeah, but well, they want to come back. <laughs> I guess it's hard to get internet out there. Yeah. Um, so I noticed you have Tom Woods' uh, blessing for all of this. I think that's great. Yeah, he's been very supportive. It's it's been a great help. It's it's, it's very encouraging at that too. All right. Why won't he run for the chair? There's a lot of problems with uh, with Sarwark. Yeah, Sarwark. Right. Main thing is uh, he's he's a father of five young daughters, man. You know, and how many children does Ron Paul have? They're all they're all grown though. All grown. He oh, has he has yeah. five young he's daughters. Got yeah. He's got grandchildren. He's got to tend to right. Yeah, and and I think he's having a great time killing it in in marketing. Right. Um, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, to go from that to I mean, I guess he could still do that, but uh, to go from that to this like thankless. Uh, volunteer position over a, a shit show national party. Oh no, he um, did the whole seventy five dollars an hour. <laughs> yeah, that was well, that was voted down. Though. <laughs> so the fight continues. The fight for seventy five. <laughs> I think, Hashtag. and then he can say, okay, no more of this weird libertarian socialist nonsense. Let's put an end to that. Uh, who invited them, anyways? Yeah, um, it's it, it's born so it's born out of this it, it, desperation, in, in my opinion. It's right. it's born out of desperation in that there's a there's a viewpoint in the party where it's it's by by leadership that it would essentially be something like tyranny to kick people out or or in other words to enforce the the statement of principles right um now right. i i get the point of like how rigid do you want to do it but 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 when there's people who are 100 percent opposed who are you know when, when we're at the point where there's communists on our national debate stage saying right. rent is theft um it's pretty obvious to me that that there should be some kind of standards that are enforced right. and that's not just my opinion like successful people have standards right you know what i mean and if and it's a political party you need to raise money you need to raise capital you need to get wins you need to get confidence and if you go to successful people and they see that they see people waving you know they see uh socialists and communists wa basically waving uh blue dildos to signal to their people to vote yes and pink ones to signal to vote no. Right, right. Um, when they know that you have no standards, you're a joke. Right. You're a complete joke. And they're and and not only will they say no, they will make sure to never look at you again. Right. You need to kick out all the James Weeks of, of the group for sure. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that was the. I mean, everyone's like, oh, James Weeks, oh, that was funny, it was hilarious. I'm like, that was not hilarious. Like, right. I, and one thing that bothered me about 2016, 2016 is when I really got involved with the Libertarian Party. Like, I didn't join it, but like, I started paying attention. I started taking like. What is this like? What? Why? Why did Gary Johnson, you know, flame out? Like I just was interested. So, I, I, as much as everyone hates Austin Peterson, I really liked Austin Peterson. I, I every single time I go with iSideWith.com, it was always ninety eight percent him and like ninety four percent Gary Johnson. Ninety two. He's got a punchable face. Though, he, you know? I, I, dude, he is, I always say he is a dork and he's a walking libertarian bumper sticker. And he acts like he invented all those phrases. There's I get it. Old I get picture it. fun of him larping, where he's got really long hair and he used to do like medieval larping. And Did he really, oh, literally yeah, larping? Literally. Yeah. You gotta send he's that got to the me. armor. He's got a sword. His hair is coming down to here. That's amazing. Yeah. It's Can so you him. send this to me? Yeah. I'll find yes. Out. Okay. Please yeah. <laughs> So I think he's still LARPing. I think that's where all this kind of comes from. Uh, it just never stopped. But I, but I really, I, I just did. I liked him. I, I thought he was better than, and they had like that mini debate um, on Fox Business. Mm -hmm. And I just was like, why, like why, like why the hate resentment? Like why can't his message, his he sounded like he had more principle than anybody up there, even though he had trouble with saying nap or trying to, you know, he was like the wording of it, whatever. But all the shit that like Gary Johnson would, how he would treat him, like Gary would just like. Behind closed him. doors, just yeah. shit on him, and like it, he it was, did, he took his gun and threw it threw in the, the trash. trash. Like yep. he threw it in the like what the like that was just so petty. And then I started realizing the circle of Sarwark and his lap dogs, like, and I'll, I don't care, I'll say it, like Andy Craig and all these guys. It just they all it's like a cult of Sarwark. It mm. is like it, and it's it's weird. And they and like the Cato people, they all think that they're like the like the Beltway. Everyone calls them the Beltway Libertarians. They're and, bougie, right? And it's mm. but they like they think they're the cool kids at the table, but they're not even in the same cafeteria as as the as the people running the country. So for them to just to be like, ew, no, you're not milk in my circle because you know you're a little too. You, you said the word Mises too much, and I don't like it, so I can't have you in anything to do with you. Like it's a weird type of exclusion going on, and mm. that's when I got you know that's when I you know I met Mike and really inspired me. I was like, you know what? I want this to be the party when it, everyone falls back on whenever I want it to be clear and concise message. I don't want it to be this wishy washy, not Republican, but we're Bill Weld. Right. It's just, that reminds me. Right. That's another question or answer I have for your question of why did I do it? 
this is going to sound like I'm like exaggerating, but it's not. I had an actual nightmare at the beginning of this where I had a nightmare where Bill Weld won the nomination and he got on the debate stage and basically he was behind a podium in front of a shitload of people and was like, this is the, and was giving the first impression of libertarianism. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, like, that is a nightmare. Yeah, yeah and, and, right. and like, and basically given the first impression of like, this is what libertarian is, and I woke up, no, you know, and, like, and, and 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 I was like, that absolutely cannot happen. Like that can't happen because people people joke like clown on the LP, but I think we'll all if if something like that ever happened, if we if we allow it to get to the debate stage in, in the state that it's in, I think we will all grow to regret giving it away very very quick. Yeah, uh, because because if you Google libertarian. As much as we are, we are all in the tradition that we're in. It's not the Mises Institute that's the first thing that comes up. It's not. It's not all of our favorite things. It's the LP, right? And and there's something to say for perception. You know what I mean? Like public perception and and linguistic territory and right. and and all of that. Um, and right. That's exactly why I got involved. Like I was tired of this term being tossed around. Yeah. Yeah, and the you know a little of the left and a little of the right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're we're the best of both horrible worlds. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, like right. like and and but yeah, that was, so that was the other answer to your question. That I'm sorry to cut you off. That no, was, no, yeah, no. That, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I didn't expect to like uh, Austin Pearson's debate with Tom Woods. I thought uh, he was uh, monopolizing the time in a tactful way that Tom Woods couldn't answer all his questions. And of course, if Tom Woods couldn't answer his questions, it seems like he won on by default. Right. Yeah. So, like, if I ask, like, you ask me a question, I'll spend like five minutes answering like a lot of different points, and it's back to you. It's like, well, I don't want to talk all the time, right? I have him as a guest, so uh, I think that was a weird way for him to kind of avoid actually answer this stuff and kind of be honest with that. I don't know. He's kind of too sneaky for me. I I, I get that. Yeah. I but see, I, I was never really like I'm not. I'm not a cult. I just realized he was the one in there, and I was like, well, Gary. Yeah, I mean, he like, I stuff. like Austin better than I like Mac he McAfee, McAfee, and I, I, I just I was a McAfee guy, <laughs> but I, I kind of conceded the whole time that I I knew Gary was going to get it. What about yes. McAfee? Though? That's Same not here. a good character. Well, I'm going to eat my. Dick. It was a, it was a, well, This is pre dick eating comments. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like this. <laughs> this was this was pre dick eating comments. This was pre uh, pump and dump. Uh, yeah. all coins every day. Uh, this yeah. is, you know what I mean? Like this is pretty a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I don't begrudge anybody for for like who they supported, but just like give. It just I, I realized that's when I first started realizing with the party that there was a circle of people, and if you weren't in it, you don't stand a chance. And I feel right. like that's you're doing the same thing that happens to you guys when you're excluded from these debates and you're going on, and you're suing people saying I want to get on debates. And you're right, but then you're like. But I don't want this sect of libertarians over here to like they don't represent. They me. don't want right. to accept that there's no concession that we can make to make us acceptable to our enemies, and they don't even concede that right. the people that are our enemies are our enemies that they're potential allies. And, yeah, and, right. all, and like there's sects that are that are potential allies or coalition groups and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But like yeah. to 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 use the party as as leadership to try to chase identity politics like. Right. Those are people right. that there's nothing that we could do that, to make them like us. I mean, right. Tho, Tho Bishop from the Institute made a really good post yesterday of, like, uh, you know, Charles Koch dying and um, just the response the from the – Yeah, yeah like, no and, it. and yeah. it's just, like, complete hate. Like, these people are completely driven by hate and they're completely ideologically possessed. Um, they can't see the world through anything other than their tribe and their – their ideology they're right. very bad ideology if you're not that, part of them you're an enemy yeah yeah and uh and we want to bring them in along with their culture right around with that uh it's it's vicious it's toxic and like i wouldn't what would you want to bring that kind of those kinds of people in um i'm sure there's people who come from the left sure but it's not like uh, a huge pattern well well here's the point i make because like if i may say so myself the biggest success that we have was a coalition with the left um I helped, well, we helped the Denver psilocybin decriminalization For initiative. The single issue stuff. Yeah. 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 And we, we helped put that over the top. And, and the guy who started that acknowledges that. And he was very helpful, very grateful. I had him on Tom Woods. I had him on a whole bunch of podcasts. And now he's calling himself a libertarian. So mm. stuff like that. You, so like the, the big question I asked myself is like, all right, we want to outreach to the left. How do we do that? To me, the n easy, no-brain answer is, why don't we talk about subsidies, you know, and our opposition to subsidies? They hate corporations, you know, so why not talk about any uh, corporate welfare? 
well, no, we'll go after identity politics. Yeah. Like, and, and, and it just it makes no sense. And it's it's like it's run by the CIA. I'm not saying it is run by the CIA, <laughs> but like I, I, this is a Tom Woods yeah, it's play. Cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I couldn't tell you the difference whether it is or not, and that's the problem. That's what I find. The, the, <laughs> what about um, uh, closed borders? Can the Libertarian Party ever get a position on being pro borders? See, I, I think that's another area where the party goes wrong that we have solved right. within our little microcosm in the yeah. party. Because, um, so the party is in their platform explicitly pro-choice mm -hmm. and explicitly open border. But my position, but then there's also something in the party that called the Dallas Accord. And what the Dallas Accord is is basically the party does not take a position on whether or not it is a minarchist party or an anarchist party. Okay, so essentially both are welcome. Now I think 95% of the time we are used to our policies line, our, our principles manifesting the same way when it comes to policies. We all oppose the drug war, we all oppose the wars, generally speaking, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But these two issues, they manifest differently. Be, and, and so with borders, I think the question isn't so much open or closed, is who ought to own the border? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is the government, then I would argue that the if the government owns the border, the open border position actually makes more sense because the government doesn't generally have the right to discriminate the way that private organizations do and, and all that kind of stuff. But then you have to actually concede that the government ought to own the border. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, and uh, with or you the, could say, uh, I would want, like, I, w I like words, right? I mean, I hate the, the monopoly that they have, right, and the way that they have other people do it, and I don't have a choice in that. But I would still would, would want roads, even if there was no government. Right. I would still want a border, even if there was no government. Right. right? And and so theoretically, I guess you could have closed borders in a private border setting. Yeah. But I don't think that's what would happen. I, I, I don't think that – because the question you got to ask yourself is what would be the interest in private people owning the borders? Do you really think it would be John and Jane homeowner that, that are collectively end up eating all this land on the border? I seriously doubt it. You could kind of see it in the Texas uh, demographics where along the border is kind of bluish and a, a little – bit outside of that is kind of reddish and they all those kind of people kind of do want a border of course the one along the borders don't because uh they have cultural clashes i can see various groups of people coalescing around like a certain set of principles within this group of well, what about a bit of property and then outside of that property maybe other people don't so there's your border you know well, right? how, but again what do you think that i think there would be a very significant commercial interest in who owns the border and, and that commercial interest would be stemmed around stemmed around so i think there would be huge organizations sure. that would basically consult with business consult with churches consult with nonprofits, and the demand for labor would would basically dictate because it would basically be their job they're hired by business to vet immigrants vet workers that's my problem right and, it's the vetting problem. and, and well well yeah but that, i think the workers would so i think commercial interests basically eat up the majority of that land they would probably be contracted with businesses who want to hire labor and and vet labor even churches that want refugees and then they so those people that want to bring people in are outsourcing because what are they going to want? Any Joe Schmo? They're, no, they have application processes. They want people who could do the jobs. So that would be your vetting. You know what I mean? There would probably be some base standards in that. And I think there, because of that dynamic, there would be a very significant commercial interest in who owns the, 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 the borders. And I think immigration would basically ebb and flow with the demands of labor. And without, of course, the U.S. stifling other countries and disrupting their right their civilization, like we talked about, or like Rick Sanchez pointed out today. Yeah, of course. It's great talk. Right. Yeah, but I, I like to bring up sometimes that like uh, even European countries have come through a lot of uh, turmoil themselves, two world wars, tens of millions dead. Uh, but you don't see them like running off into like in the masses of millions into other countries, right, as refugees. They stick out around there and they rebuild their own country. Uh, they rebuild their culture. They rebuild their lives. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't buy it sometimes of uh, – this whole, well, you know, this has happened, this is blowback, but, you know, this has happened to also here, and you don't see them running off to other countries and flooding it in. There's expatriates, for sure, but not to, the, like, the numbers of, like, trying to break through their borders and go inside there as well. Um, and I think one of the things that they were mentioning, yeah, lift the sanctions, so at least you have, like, 8 million people that can put a resistance against uh, Venezuelan uh, leadership there uh, and reclaim their own country, because that's going to be their story to tell, right, that they kind of need. Um, I think that's one question I have is like, what, when is uh, interventionism good? When, when can we intervene in another country? It seems to be like all of them saying, well, it's all negative, it's all bad. 
Um, but we also had some intervention here in the American Revolution. We had friends <laughs> come in and lend some arms uh, and helped us become liberated. Um, so what do you guys think? When is intervention good, justified? I'm going, I'm going to cop out and basically say private. Like, I, I would rather try to send my AK to Hong Kong right now <laughs> than, than, than the government take my AK and send it. Right. Right. And I, I think right. the damage has been done of bad interventionism in South America, overseas. I think we have now become this empire. And it's anything we do is going to be seen as it's going to create. Well, I'll just say this. It'll be create more and more people who are like, I think how we feel the government is on our back. And we feel like when we're like, damn it, like taxes went up or my property bill tax went up. And it's just, you have this feeling of resentment. It just, even if it's for a momentary, like that's how other people feel. But oh, it's only like, oh, no, great. Why is, why am like in Hong Kong? Why is there an American diplomat in here meeting with the student? meeting with the students like why why does america have to be involved why are they always fomenting all this discourse or is that the right word i'm looking for probably not but um fom like and right. so they're causing all this trouble and i feel like now that ship has sailed maybe in the maybe if there was one cause we were this this not a uh, lack of better term isolated country where we just we st we're like we're like switzerland and then when there was some type of ethnic cleansing going on if you were Swiss switzerland and you were like you had troops that you could bring in to stop and peacekeepers that you could just send in once and it's the only time you've done that in like a hundred years mm. and then you once everything got peaceful you you held negotiations between the t factioning sides and you came to a resolution and then you withdrew your troops and that was it Maybe that yeah. could be something like how France did back then, but I feel like the, it's damage has been done. I mean, anytime America goes anywhere, you're gonna create enemies, and I, I just feel like right now there's there's no good place for us to intervene on where we're gonna come out looking good, or it's not gonna be well. This is for this isn't for you know people are just gonna intervene so we can get people at Raytheon to get more uh, you know sell right. weapons, or in Northrop Grumman's gonna sell more weapons and they're gonna profit off of it. Yeah, right? the only intervention that seems to work is trade. And which is not, I guess, yeah. by definition, it's not an invention. Yeah. But you're, if you're selling weapons to people uh, who want them, then uh, tech, maybe you're intervening. I don't know. Mm. But really, at the end of the day, they're better able to protect themselves from tyrannical government. I just remember that blowback from the French involvement in the American Revolution. It bankrupt the government, the monarch, which led then to the French Revolution, which led to the wholesale onslaught of like hundreds of thousands of Christians, the Catholics, um, that nobody really talks about. They, yeah. think, they think it was, oh, great. All yeah, was oh, gonna, yeah, that yeah. was what I was going to say, was what was the cost of that for them? Right. right. And, and then even the other question I would ask is for to the, our perspective, it was, you know, we, it worked out for us. But for every one of them, how many how many of the opposite situations right. is it where it doesn't work out for anybody? You know what I mean? And <laughs> it's like one of those things you want to give all these free clothes to Africans and, and those little towns, but it competes against like the shirt maker and like now you just ruin their economy, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't long before, I mean, they... In the United States, they reinterpreted the entire Constitution and, and said it was a completely different document than how it was ratified by the states. So, I mean, very quickly it, it changes, you know. And it wasn't supposed to be ratified to begin with. They were supposed to amend the, the Articles of Confederation. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So the, the Constitution itself was a coup. We don't right. look at it that right. way. Yeah. And, right. you know what I, mean? like, I, I celebrate Articles of Confederation Day. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who's like a hardcore constitutionalist, or us, and uh, so I always kind of bring it up. He's kind of bother him. He's like, Arr. yeah, he's a Schiff guy, so <laughs> oh, it's yeah. okay. It's all right. Um, what, what Peter Schiff? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't like Schiff? No, no I like him, friend. but he's yeah. you know. Our friend Until he starts talking about Bitcoin, that's the problem, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think he finally made uh, an amend saying like. All right, maybe I should have bought some Bitcoin. <laughs> well, yeah, well, he said that based on of like, well, yeah, of course, if it was like eight cents, and, uh, and you know, I would have made a lot of money. But no, my, you know, what my problem is because I've actually met him once, and I asked him what I consider to be for someone of his level a very basic question of because the whole argument was it's not it, it, it has no intrinsic value. So I'm like, the, the concept of intrinsic value, I think, is a very fallacious idea, especially because right. he's a. a from the Austrian school, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I was like, so how do you even square that idea with with uh, uh, subjective value, you know? And I was like, because I, it sounds to me like you're conflating inherent value and utility. And you mm -hmm. can't argue that, that there's no utility to Bitcoin because it's an immutable ledger. It's, it's secure. It's unhackable. 
you know, and, and it's it's got those those properties to it. But it's just digital. But then you're gonna have to say the whole internet is worthless. You know what I mean? And right, and or Netflix right. is worthless and, 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 and all these services. And he didn't really have an answer for it. And that's when I kind of got the idea of like, wow, I think this guy's purposely full of shit for his company. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, like, that's, where you got, that's where I stumped Russ actually a long time ago. Because uh, so are you saying that gold has objective value? Right? And it's like, yes. And then I had to go down the whole economic lesson about that. Right. Shit. It has utility. Yeah. It has yeah. utility, but not objective Check. value. Right. Right. Yeah. I'm so, gl- I'm so glad we got this recorded because I'm going to go back and memorize my that defense because I'm like, <laughs> yes, that's so good for me. Like, I can never put defending. You see all like, my notes I take on my phone. I'm like, yes. All right. So good. I, I'm going to go. Tr- uh, you going to send over the transcript of this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is at the 50 mark. <laughs> Perfect. Nice. Um, so love, we were, love him otherwise, though. Right. Yeah, yeah. Love yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. He's still on our side, right? If yeah. Him and all that stuff. Absolutely. I think that's good. Right. Um, I'm not gonna like, uh, it's like, oh no, like forget this guy, or just kind of dismiss it, because the the left don't do that anyways to themselves, right? Your malice will come on here, even though malice was like uh, a pedophile king in his country, where he'd bring in like young underage girls and have pajama parties, and then he spread Ooh. his STDs to them, but. And then when they say when you bring that up to these these people, it's like uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Like it's, it's like, yeah. <laughs> capitalist pig, right? right. Well, it's, it's part of the it's part of the group thing because once you're the so you you're, once you're ideologically possessed, there's basically no difference between the ideology and morality itself. So we wrong think, so everything we do is bad. But then if you right think, everything you do is good. Right. You know what I mean? And it's it's really scary how this shit possesses people. I, I, ideological possession is is uh, a really scary thing that I've really come to understand because now that I really understand it, I fucking see it everywhere and it really sucks. All right. <laughs> like... Mm. Even in libertarian circles, you mentioned it earlier. You've matured. You said, yeah. you know, and it used to be well. You had to be hundred percent. You were ideologically possessed. I used to be ideologically possessed when I was in my angry beginning and cat phase. Right, and it, it takes a hold of you. It, it's crazy. Yeah, um, I guess uh, seeing that there are other groups out there kind of helped. Uh, like going to the Mises Institute helped, and seeing like the bigger picture of like the history of libertarianism. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I started doing a uh, libertarian, I thought I was like the only free market anarchist out there because uh, <laughs> I never heard of the word anarcho-capitalist. So it wasn't until like many months later when we were doing our thing, and people started friending me on Facebook, and there's someone was like, "That makes perfect sense. That is such a good word, anarcho-capitalism." <laughs> uh, and I was like, "Well, who did that?" R- Rothbard, and like reading about all this other stuff. So funny so. that like, going back to what we talked about before, like when we first started about getting into libertarianism. Uh, when I was I was Australian, I was also vegan, and I remember um, there was an episode of bullshit by Penn and Teller. And I remember they were like going off saying how vegans is bullshit and whatever. I watched the whole thing and I wanted to know more about them politically. I'm like, well, where do they stand from? And I, you go to their like page and someone said, uh, they, I forget which page it was, but like, their political philosophy was like conservatism or whatever. And it said anarcho capitalism. I'm like, what the hell is anarcho capitalism? So, and I looked at it, I'm like, oh. And then it, I found it worked its way back to Ron Paul. And I'm like, right. okay, <laughs> there we go. All right. All, right. All <laughs> roads lead to Ron Paul. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. This is funny. We were just talking about that. But I like that. All those roads uh, brought us together here. Right. Right. I yeah. think that's great. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> In that way. <laughs> We're approaching our 50 some minute mark. Uh, any last comments you want to make about the Mises Cau- Caucus? Well, I guess I'll just give a quick rundown. Yeah. Um, so. What we're doing specifically, uh, and now that we've created Mises Pack, is we are what's called a hybrid pack. So we have two; ba- we're one committee, two bank accounts, and those bank accounts can do two, you know, specific things. So we are raising money in the, what's called the traditional pack to uh, to give money to local level candidates and county level candidates around the country that we vet and deem viable. And uh, and then the super pack, what we want to do is raise money there to pay people to get involved in issue coalitions so pay them to get involved in decriminalizing shrooms uh you know whether it's or ballot initiatives in the states that allow them or just lobbying efforts primarily at the local level uh in the states that don't and the next one that i want to go to is i want to do like a complete 180 from the shrooms and try to go down into texas before it goes blue 
and and see if we can't get the uh, local level gun preservation right. act passed and a bunch of towns and daisy chain it and basically be like well, even if it does go blue you ain't touching the fucking guns right. so <laughs> so that would be awesome that would um, be awesome so we're doing that we we started a podcast called ask an austrian that's um available in all the podcasts major podcast platforms where we just take we literally just take questions from the audience about libertarian theory or austrian economics and we have a a, a rotation of uh, economists from the Mises Institute that will answer them. We're going to have Murray Sabrin this month. Um, nice. And we're also doing, there's a debate actually going on on September 10th in New York with uh, Dave Smith and Nick Sarwark. Right. I'm and uh, Gene Epstein is actually hosting an after party fundraiser at his home for us. Hmm. So, uh, you know, check that out, get tickets. That's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a panel discussion. Uh, called for a new libertarian party uh, outreach. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. You get the play on where Yeah, love it. Uh, yeah, uh, outreach and strategy. Nice. Um, yeah. So there's there's just a lot going on. I mean, we have over we have over forty organizers. We're raising more money than most of the state parties. So uh, Mises, LP Mises Caucus dot com, Austrian dot com, Mises Pack dot com. Yes, I like that. I like that. And how can we find more about Punk Rock Libertarians? So look up uh, Punk Rock Libertarians on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we go live on Facebook with their podcast um, every Sunday night. We uh, definitely anywhere you get your podcast from, you just search Punk Rock Libertarians. Um, it's yeah, you know, every like I said, every Sunday night weekly thing we do. Um, we also. Uh, that's about it for me. You guys are gonna come for Anarchon next year. I, I'm, I'm gonna do my, every effort I can to come. Cause it looked awesome. It was. It, I'm definitely regret not coming. So. No, no, we'll do a whole like uh, podcast there too. Yeah, the table. It'll be a lot of fun. It'll be awesome. Hell yeah. Um, well, thank you guys for coming. Thank you well, for, for your, us, your services. Yep. <laughs> thanks, man. Appreciate With that. Uh, stay liberated and get off my property. All right. <laughs>